Good morning. I'd like to ask Sharon Duffy to come up. One of the things that we've had the opportunity to become involved with as a church, meeting the needs of children, students with special needs, and it's, it happened through a number of different related events. Number one, I don't know which, well, the one that came first is the Bethkeys. Found out about a child, special needs from Mexico, and they became involved first as foster parents and now as adoptive parents for Marco. And at the same time, Lisa Holtman is a specialist in dealing with the needs of children with special needs. She works for the school district in that capacity, coming alongside educators, helping them to know how to specially target the needs of special needs children. So these have come together, and Lisa now is moving towards creating a context in which those with special needs are educated in a way that is appropriate to them, more visual kind of things on a Sunday morning. They create visual things. Here's what our schedule looks like this morning. And it's not words, it's pictures. And then that, that with a student with special needs, that's something that they can identify with. Uh, so it's something that we kind of are excited about being able to be involved in. Ask Sharon to come up. There is an autism walk, and I asked her to tell us a little bit about that and uh, kind of clue us in on how we might be involved. Thanks, Sharon. Like Mike said, um, our son Marco um, has some other special needs, but probably the most prevalent thing that we have to deal with on a daily basis is the autism. And so through the process of getting to know him and getting to know about autism, Dan and I made a few determinations. And first of all, we determined to preserve our marriage and our family because the divorce rate among families with special needs children is extremely high. And the other thing that we determined was to come alongside other families who are dealing with the same things and be a support to them. And then the third was to build a community around us, not only to support us, but also to um, give a place for us as a family and the individuals in our family to be a part of a community, not just live in a community. And so when we found out there was going to be a walk to fundraise for autism, we got really excited. And we felt like... Hope was a good place to build that team because um, there are actually at least two other families at Hope that have children with autism. And so um, the event's going to be really fun, very family-friendly. can bring the whole family. There's going to be music and food and inflatables and a resource fair for the families who have kids with autism to um, guide them towards resources or books or things like that. Uh, there are brochures on the information tables and a sign-up sheet. We would love to have a huge team. It should be so fun. I'm going to have team t-shirts made so we can all walk together as a big group. And I'm going to try really hard to get a picture of the kids um, from Hope on the t-shirt. And um, there's information in your worship folders. It is Saturday, October 11th. Registration's at 9. The walk is at 10.15 at the Sioux Falls Stadium, which is where the Canaries play. Um, it's only one and a half miles, so that shouldn't deter anyone from taking part. It shouldn't be too hard. Um, and then I just want to brag a little bit. The website is on the sheet in your information folders. Um, it takes you right to our team page, and you can. it says in your worship folders you can join the team on that web page. You can um, just support a walker on the team. We have, um, including our family members, seven people on the team so far and Team Hope is right now ranked number one for fundraising. We have so far $1,145 in donations pledged and we're just getting started. I mean we only have a few people on the team and then um, Jody Swenson or Jamie Swenson who is on our team and she goes to Hope. She is the top fundraiser at this point for the whole Sioux Falls walk. So it should be a really fun day. I encourage you all to come out and be a part of the community of Hope and um, the community that supports people and families with autism. We're in a series where we're talking about the Ten Commitments, and these commitments you think of a commitment, you usually think of commitment from ours to someone else. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the Ten Commitments, and those commitments are God's commitments to us. 
over on that table over there. If any of you do not have, we put it on cardstock. So these ten commitments are on cardstock. In fact, I think um, Tammy, who works in the office, has taken some time to cut them into a packet so that they're individual things that you can review. And that's one thing we are encouraging each other, is that to the degree you know and understand these commitments, they can, they, they're easier to believe. And so if, you would, if you're interested in take one of the sheets or one of the card packs that are already cut up, you can have those with you. And when you're having lunch, you can just kind of review and think about them. The more you get them into your brain, the more they can help. As we've said, there are five levels of learning. You can hear something, read it, study it, memorize it, and meditate on it. And the, when you hear something, it's not as good as when you read it. When you read it, it's not as good as when you study it. When you study it, it's not as good as when you memorize it. And when you memorize it and meditate it, that is the way that you can bring the information into a place where it is able to in influence you to the greatest degree. And that's why we encourage you, get a pack and begin to memorize these and meditate on them. When we think of the commitments, there is a... Before we can, there's a, a phrase that we're going to return to. Before we can keep God's commitments, we must believe that God can keep his... I'm sorry. Before we can keep God's commandments, we must believe that God can keep his commitments. You know the commandments. Honor the Lord. No false witnesses. No false images. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't destroy. Don't covet. Uh, these things are things that God would have us do. They're things that are important. But what we're saying is before we can keep his commandments, we must believe that he can keep his commitments. Let me turn it around. To the degree we believe God can keep his commitments, we will keep his commandments. And for us what this means is this. As we would think then together about moving forward in our spiritual life, having a life that is more obedient to his standards, the step in order that we might accomplish that is to become more aware of his commitments to us. The greater our awareness and belief in his commitments, the greater will be our ability to keep the commandments. That seems to be the way they're connected. And we looked at several of them. We looked at one last week, God sees me. Remember, we did it with the children. He sees me. And today, we're talking about God sympathizes with me. When we think about God sympathizing with me, where we're going to start is why we need God's sympathy. Why do we need God's sympathy? And the first reason why we need God's sympathy is because of God's word. Look what it says in Hebrews 4, 11 through 13. It's in your worship folder. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 11 through 13. Let me read and you follow along. It says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. And this passage says a couple of things. Number one, it says that God's word reveals his message to us. God has something he wants us to know. It's news that he wants us to hear, that he wants to proclaim to us. And his word reveals this news. And the word gospel, which is a way to describe God's message, literally means good news. So the news God would have us hear is called the gospel or good news. Now, with good news, what do, you, what do you do with news? If I give you a piece of information relative to the Olympics or some other kind of news, there's one of two things you can do with it. You can believe the news or not believe the news. 
And so when God, God's message to us has the character of good news. Now there are commandments in God's message. Commandments are things you don't believe, they're things you do. When I command you to do something, you do it or you don't do it. But when I give you news, news isn't something you do, it's something you believe or you don't believe. And that's what God's message to us. It contains commandments, but at its core, it's news. And therefore, God's Word reveals the news that God wants us to believe. It's like an ambassador who carries a message in the leader's place. When Condoleezza Rice goes to a foreign country to indicate this is the stand of the United States on, in this particular concern, she represents the president in that capacity. And so God's word represents God as what God would have us understand what he wants us to hear. Not only does God's Word reveal His message to us, God's Word registers our response to His message. Now, this is kind of weird. You know, there's some email that when you send it, there's, a, there's something in there that you can respond to the message with either I'll do it or I won't do it. God's Word is like that. It's not just a one-way communication that goes out. God's Word, well, look what it says. The Word of God is living and active, and I'm reading the verse again. And let's listen then as it talks about the Word is active. What does it do? It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So what does God's Word do? In what way is it active? What it says here, it judges. It judges. And what it is able to do then, not only to reveal the message, but to register our response to the message. It both indicates what he wants and indicates to God what our response was to the news. And the response that the word brings back to God is not just about what we did with it. It's about how we believed it and how we believed it in the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. God's word when it says it's sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates to dividing soul and spirit. The reason it says that is it cuts to the center of us. And it registers our response, not from what we say, but from what we believe deep inside. God's Word registers our thoughts, which are, are the opinions about God that we say to ourselves. God gives us news. And at some level, all of us struggle with unbelief. Sure. Now, we would never say that to him. Some of us have developed an honesty with God. David in the Psalms was very honest with God. For a lot of us, that level of honesty is difficult for us to... We, you know, we would never say that out loud. You know, we would never say that to anyone or say that to God. But what God's Word is able to do, it understands... The deep reaction, when we go inside, it, it registers that. It, it, it knows that. Thoughts and attitudes. See, thoughts are opinions about God that we keep to ourselves. Things that only God can see. Attitudes are responses to God's will based on our thoughts about Him. For instance, if I think God is harsh, rigid, mean, brutal... Say if those are my thoughts about him. I would never say to God, you're brutal, you're harsh, but underneath, if you peel away what I believe, and if that's really what I believed, a question, how would that affect my response to his will? When God says to me, don't steal, don't commit adultery, how might my thoughts about him impact my response to him? If he's an ogre and he's harsh, I'm going to listen to what he wants from me and say, sure, you want that. Of course you'd want something like that. And my response to him is not going to be very good. Now, I never tell him that. But what the Word of God does, it registers that response, the deep response within us. Why do we need sympathy? Because of the nature of God's Word. Because of what it does. It is not just a one-way communication. It's a tool that reveals and registers our response. That's why it says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. I'll tell you what, you and I, we're like open books. 
not to one another. I can pull the wool over your eyes. You can pull the wool over my eyes. We can't pull the wool over God's eyes. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Why do we need sympathy? Because of God's word and because of our weakness. And our weakness is this. It says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? See, our weakness, we're not good at reading one another's hearts. We're not even good at seeing what's in our hearts. There's a lot that is in us that we prefer not to look at. We prefer to look away, to not really think about what's happening inside. Our culture is not one that is high on reflection and introspection. We would rather keep busy, keep something on the TV, keep an iPod in my head, keep something happening. I need to keep going because when we stop, it's uncomfortable to think about what's happening inside. How we really feel about God, how we really feel about his will. That can be uncomfortable for us. And and some of us look and say, everything's fine. (laughs) The fact is, our heart is deceitful. It looks one way, but if you peel underneath, as the word does, it's able to penetrate. There's stuff in our hearts. There's stuff in our hearts. There's stuff in our hearts. Hearts that is not pretty. That's selfish. That's unresponsive. That's hard. It's, and it's true for all of us. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And again, this is part of our weakness, is that we can't see into motives. And part of our weakness is that we judge by external appearances. So we can, we can indicate, hey, you're doing great. Why are you doing great? Because you're doing everything right. You know, you're doing the right things at the right time in the right way. And so I look at you maybe, and if I'm the one that's judging, I would say, I think, thumbs up. And that's okay, but the thing we have to be aware of is when God judges, he doesn't judge like we judge. And when God is going to scrutinize somebody, he does not look on the outside appearance. He peels through that and says, I'm really interested in what you think about me. I'm interested in what your thoughts about me are. I'm interested in your opinion of my will because of your thoughts about me. There is a word, accountability, that describes the influence that some Christians want to have on other Christians. And there's a a way, you know, there used to be accountability groups. You don't hear about them as much anymore. And an accountability group is when you get together with a group of men or women and, and you kind of open yourself up to one another. How are you doing? And we're honest with one another. I think that there's a way in which that could be helpful only if it's encouraging. I've seen some of those groups be very toxic. And toxic for this reason. Individuals put themselves in a place where they claim to be able to speak for God. I cannot speak for God relative to judging you. You know why? I can't see what's in your heart. You can't see what's in my heart. I am not accountable to you. You're not accountable to me. Because our accountability is heart deep. And only God can read that. It's just so we know. And so that's about why we need sympathy is because of God's word and our weakness. We cannot see all that is in our heart. God can. That's the weakness. We can't see everything in our heart. God can. And that's what he judges. Why do we need sympathy? Would you agree that those are some reasons? God is not going to scrutinize our behavior. He's going to scrutinize our thoughts and attitudes. For some of us, that's bad news. Because we're fine on the outside, but not real good on the inside. For others of us, that's good news, because we're a mess on the outside. But inside, we're really trying as best we can to believe God's commitments so that we can obey his commandments. And that's what God's going to look at. Why do we receive God's sympathy? Let's look at that. Why we receive God's sympathy? The first reason is because of the Father's will. 
Look what it says. Again, in, in the sheet in your worship folder, every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. No one takes this honor upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So, Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. High priests specialize in sympathy. The reason they function as intermediates between God and people. God appoints them and they speak to people on God's behalf. And because they are weak themselves, they're able to sympathize. Now, high priests specialize in sympathy. Whose idea was it to establish high priests? Whose idea was it? Was it your idea? My idea? Was it the son's idea? No, I'm going to make a little bit of a difference between the father and the son, but I'm going to connect them together. We think about Jesus as being sympathetic, and we often think of the father as being more distant, less approachable. Whose idea was it to put high priests in place, individuals that sympathize with human weakness. Was it the sons or the fathers? Now, they're both the... It was the fathers. Because the father selected the son to be high priest. Now, you might say, Mike, what's the difference? Father, son, for, the, for this specific purpose, I'm drawing a distinction. But they're both the same. They both sympathize, but we don't normally see the Father as sympathetic, but it is His will that we are able to have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. It's not that the Father is stern and that the Son is loving. That, ma that masks the connection between the Father and the Son. They are united in their desire. Jesus is a bridge for us to the Father, not just because He died, but because he lived. And in that sense, he's able to understand why. Because he lived in a mortal body. And why did he live in a mortal body? So that God could sympathize with us. So that he could know what it feels like to be driven by a desire. To try to harness that desire and not lead it to become a moral issue. God gets that. Why? Because... He came to earth in order to be able to sympathize with us. This is really interesting what's happening in this passage. We come up to this place. It seems like we're going to run headlong into something that's not really pretty. Now again, here's what the passage says. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give account. Does it seem like you know where this is going to head? Therefore, you and I are in a heap of trouble. That's not where the road goes. We're facing God's scrutiny, then all of a sudden, it goes to talk about but we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. It looks like we're going to run smack dab into a world of a, a wall of judgment, but that's not what we face. It's almost like, oh gosh, I know you see inside me, and it's like we, you know, I guess I'm not going to be able to get away with the fact that you're going to look at what's really in there and Gosh, I don't even want to look. I, I, I really don't even, because I, I don't know what's in here, and I see a little bit of what's in here, and I don't know that I really want to look at you looking at me. And some of us spend a lot of our time doing that. But what, the text, what happens in the text is he goes like this. And what he sees astonishes him. Faced with the scrutiny of the Father, 
expecting to see condemnation. And what does he see? Compassion. That's an interesting thing. When we look into the Father's face, what we see astonishes us. When we look into the Father's face, what we see astonishes us. And what we see fuels an authentic Christian life. Your Christianity will be as authentic as your ability to perceive the compassion of the Father and the Son. God sees us and He sympathizes with us. Um, the Hebrew Christians were really having a difficult time here. And again, like I said, they had spent a lot of years with accumulated disappointments. Everything was fine in Jerusalem for the first two years. Selling their property, everybody giving things away. We've talked about it, the Rainbow Coalition. It was like a hippie commune and that everybody was sharing. No one had their own thing. It was, we're worshiping God, all kinds of miracles happening. It was just, it was all heaven breaking loose. Then the persecution started to hit. The one that Paul was involved with, where he's going from place to place, locking up Christians. Then the famines hit. Fifteen years later, it is not the Rainbow Coalition. And the daydream has become somewhat of a nightmare. They are in a place, and when we're under pressure and stress, we tend to separate from one another. And that's what's happening in this community. Some of them are saying, I can handle this. I can do this. Others are saying, I'm out. And this community is dividing. And what does he do to them to try to get them to a place where they're being more responsive? He says, God sees your heart. And you need to look and see that he sympathizes with your weakness. What occurs to me? If you have a problem being judgmental, some of us have that problem. We see ourselves as so much better than other people. And it's hard for us not to, not to feel that way. It's not like we want to. It's just that we naturally notice what others aren't doing that we are. Oh, yeah, I see you're having some problems with that. What do we need? That's what this community needed. You know what he directs their focus to? God sympathizes with your weakness. God sympathizes. You know what a person who's rigid and judgmental with others is often true? They're rigid and judgmental with themselves. Would you agree with me? Therefore, being judgmental of others, what I've, and I, I, I get that. I think we who are judgmental, I think a greater understanding of the compassion of the Father for us will lead to a greater compassion for others. Some of us it's not that we judge others, that we judge ourselves. And we pull away. We don't get mad at others. We're too busy heaping abuse on ourselves. We judge ourselves. Some of us are more like that. It's not that we judge others, we judge us. And the same thing is true. We need to know the sympathy of the Father. Because He looks at us and says, I understand. Sympathy is the medicine God uses to soften a hardened heart. I think that's, that's what the text would have us understand. That is where it goes. And I'm not reading it in. It just it goes from judgment to sympathy. And apparently this is true. What do you need? I dare say, for each one of us, a greater understanding of the sympathy of the Father and the Son would issue forth in a deeper ability to love self and others. You're saying, that's not true of me, Mike. I need, I need for God to be harsher. I don't think you do. I don't think you do. Because if you felt God was harsher, you might do different things. But what is God going to scrutinize? What you do? Or why you do it? If you're going to do something because God's going to take you onto the woodshed and, and, not, and really mistreat you, when you stand before God, is God going to feel great about that? No, He is not. He is not. 
Not just the we receive sympathy because of the Father's will, but because of the Son's work. Look what it says. Surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. There's two words, sympathy and empathy. What's the difference? Sympathy. Empathy. How would you describe the difference? Would you agree with me? Empathy seems like the response of someone who has experienced what you experience. Dealing with addiction. Empathy is someone who has dealt with addiction. And when you talk about the struggle, they say, I know what you mean. It's empathy. Empathy is close. Sympathy. Would you agree with me that sympathy can be somewhat more distant? I've never dealt with recovery, but I, yeah, I think I know what you mean. Sympathy is a little bit more distant than empathy. So here's the question. When it says he sympathizes with our weakness, is that sympathy or is it more empathy? You know what I couldn't believe? I posed this question to myself on Thursday. I said, is there more sympathy or empathy? And within a few seconds, I said, duh, if sympathy was okay, he never would have come. If distance was okay, he would have stayed in a place where he, I, I see what you mean. I see what it's like to be a human. But God's sympathy is not distant sympathy. It's close empathy. How do we know? He became a human being. And just get what Jesus does. It's not just that he climbs inside an already developed body. When Jesus is going to enter the world, he enters a womb. And he develops the way you and I developed in that womb. He is subject to the stresses of life at that time, so he really understands close and up and personal what it's like to be a human. That tells us about the character of God's sympathy. It's more empathetic. What does sympathize with our weaknesses mean? I think it's a couple of things. Jesus sympathizes with physical agitation. We talked about it a little bit before. It says, after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. You know what hunger is? A God-given alarm system. Jesus understands it. He felt physical hunger, the alarm going off, and the sense of, I have a need that my body is crying out for something. He doesn't just understand physical agitation. He understands emotional agitation. This is what he said. Now my heart is troubled. You know what troubled is? The picture of my heart is troubled. If you open the lid of a washing machine when it's, when it's spinning, when the agitator is going, and it's, it's foaming and the water is foaming up, that's agitation. It's, it's, it's a washing machine in the agitator cycle. Or it's a sea being whipped and tossed by wind. If you've ever been out in the ocean or by the ocean when it was storming and how the wind and the storm whips up the wave, that's the word for trouble. Jesus is saying, my heart is stirred up. There are emotions welling within me that are, that I just, they are washing over me. He was emotionally agitated. He was feeling fear. And he was feeling a number of different things. Fear and courage. He, he was feeling the kind of emotions that you and I, and it ends up with him, it says, my heart is troubled and what should I say? Father, save me for this hour? No, it was, was for this reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. What does sympathize with our weaknesses mean? Jesus sympathizes with the influence of frustrated mortal desires. That's what Jesus gets. You know, when you think of weaknesses, it can't mean sin. Because Jesus never sinned. You and I make poor moral choices. When Jesus sympathizes with our weaknesses, it can't mean that Jesus understands what it's like to look at something on the internet that he shouldn't have looked at. 
It doesn't mean that Jesus is a murderer or a thief, that he did those things so that he could understand. What it means is that weakness, in as much as we are influenced by our mortal desires. What am I saying? Jesus felt this, but Jesus never allowed frustrated moral desire, mortal desires to become the basis for disbelieving God's promise. Listen to me. I think this is what made Jesus Jesus. How does he sympathize with us? He knows what it's like to have fear and dread well up within. And you and I, when we feel fear and dread, our default setting is to think we're on our own. I need to take care of this myself. Jesus felt the fear and the dread. He understands what that's like. So when you deal with strong emotion, Jesus says, I know that. The thing that separates Jesus from us is that frustrated mortal agitation never became the basis of him disbelieving God's promises. Jesus' sense of the Father's care for him was bulletproof. And that's what separates him from us. Jesus always kept the Father's commandments because he always believed the Father kept his commitments. This is what made Jesus Jesus. Even when his world looked dark, he never allowed his experience to dictate to him whether God was faithful or not. Now, you and I, we aren't Jesus. Um, disappointments become disbelief in us. It, it's just what happens because we're not perfect. We're not the Son of God. We don't have a divine spirit inside. We're not going to do Jesus stuff. When we have disappointments, it's going to lead us off into this place where we're thinking, oh, thanks a bunch, you don't care about me. Jesus never stood in this place. He was getting whipped and beaten, but his circumstances did not... He, no, I'm not going there. Because that's not who my father is. My father loves me. You can't do anything that can cause me to doubt that. That's why Jesus was who he was. Now, we're not Jesus. And so we get pulled into that place. What do we do? And again, it's not an option. It's something that will happen to us. What do we do? How do we repair the breach? Or how do we experience God's sympathy? How do we experience God's sympathy? Look at the verse. It says, Now we who have believed enter that rest. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will follow, fall by following their example of disobedience. Know his commitments. There's two. Let's practice them together. The first commitment, God sees me. Hebrews 4.13 Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. That's the first commitment. I'm going to want you to think about that, to memorize it. Here's the second. These two, you put together, they're very powerful. Not only does God see me, God sympathizes with me. For we do not have a high priest who was unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15 Let's read them out loud together. They're the two commitments, the first two. And as you face disappointments in your circumstances or your conduct, put your eyes on these commitments first. Let's read the first one. God sees me. Ready? God sees me. And what's the passage? Read it one more time. Okay, now what I want you to do, look at it one more time. Now close your eyes. Let's say it together. God, go ahead. One more time. As you let that roll around in your head, I guarantee you, if you'll focus on that, take it out and think about it, you'll find 
I never saw that in that verse. The Word of God is very powerful. Okay, let's do the next one. Let's read it together first a couple of times. God sympathizes with me. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hebrews 4.15. Let's read it again. God sympathizes with me. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Now, you just read it. Let me see how you're doing. Take a look at it. Close your eyes. This is a harder one. See how you do. Go. One more time. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to be quiet. And I want to let your mind... God sees me. God sympathizes with me. I want you to think about situations that you're facing. Maybe situations at work. Pick one. Maybe situations in the workplace. Maybe situations in your family. Maybe there's illness in your family. Or, or there's, there's problems. I want you to think about that thing. Left untreated, that disappointment, and for some of you it's cumulative, will pull you to a place where your belief in God will be challenged. I want you to think about that thing, that thing that's troubling you, the thing that's troubling you today. You got it in mind? I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to put your eyes on these two things. Repeat them silently to yourself and think about them. That's all I want you to do. So you thought of something, now do these in your mind silently. Go ahead. Keep your eyes closed. Here's what's going to happen over time. You're going to become better at doing this. When you think of that thing, that circumstance in your life, let me tell you what God says. I see you. Nothing in all creation is hidden from my sight. I know your trouble. I know your grief. It's not hidden from me. It's not that I don't perceive what you're going through. I do perceive what you're going through. It's not that I'm unaware of what you're dealing with. I know your grief. I see your trouble. God sees you. He not only says He sees you, He says He sympathizes with you. He says, I sympathize with you. There's something in me that understands what you're going through. You do not have a high priest who can't sympathize with your weaknesses. Not only do I see them, it evokes within me a desire to come close to you. And knowing that He sees and sympathizes, it doesn't make the situation go away. But it makes us less alone in it, doesn't it? When you come to communion, and that's where we're going to go now, the challenge is believing in his faithfulness to keep his commitments today. Look at me. You're going to come up to this table, and you're going to take the juice, and you're going to take the bread. And here's what I'd like you to do. I'm going to keep this up for just a sec. We're going to have music. Communion is a time... Oh, you know what I'm going to do? You hear this sometime. You, when, when you come up, leave all your burdens underneath the chair. Come up free of burdens. Just all the things that you're wrestling with, just leave them there and come to God with a pure... I'm going to say take all of them with you. Carry all of them. Bundle them up in your arms. All the things that are disappointments that you'd like to be able to hide or hurl, but you can't because they keep on coming up. They're like beach balls that you try to keep under the water. Grab them. Bring them with you. And when you bring them up, understand that you're bringing them into, God, I've got these, but I also know that you see me and you sympathize with me. Well, how do we know? Because this represents you taking on a body. You felt things. You felt physical agitation and emotional agitation. 
And it's not, I don't have to carry these alone. Do you understand that? You don't have to carry these things alone. He sees and sympathizes. See, that's music, and again, during the course of the music, you take the things with you. You bring them up and you grab this proof of God's care for you. And as you grab it, think, you see me. Nothing in all creation is hidden from your sight. You sympathize with me. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. And then drink the juice and eat the bread at some point during the songs and think about what it means. He sees and sympathizes. 